bit, I feel a bit out of place here. Like, like Mandy mentioned, first, because I'm gonna talk about Palestine and not Syria, and I don't know how to do the bridge to Syria, like hopefully this conversation will. And second, because I'm a born pessimist. When I told my wife I was invited to speak about hope, she burst out laughing and choked on her coffee. My pessimism is a personal thing, we all have our issues, but it's also a political one. As we stand today, I do not see a future in Israel and Palestine where there will be justice and peace. When I look at the siege in Gaza, where people are being shot daily, I have no hope in the future. When I see growing and unchecked apartheid system in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, I have no hope in the future. When I see the bare, minimal humanitarian institutions of our refugees being dismantled, I have no hope in the future. And when I see the discrimination against Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, see no hope in the future. Now, of course, hopelessness does not stop one from thinking about hope. In fact, hope usually arises from a position of hopelessness. It is a leap of faith people take when things are at their worst. This philosophical paradox is interesting in its own right, and the title of the event, Doomed by Hope, I think captures it well. Rest assured, it is not a philosophical puzzle I want to solve with you tonight. Trained in philosophy, I, I do not want to engage in a philosophical discussion on, on hope. <laughs> Instead, I want to share something more personal, what the organizers of this panel have called trajectories of hope. This too is an interesting title, so thank you very much. Because our conceptions of hope are linked to our trajectories, the place and time we grew up in, and the ways the future is painted for us. Hope is not an abstract concept, it is part of an expression, a social construct. By which I mean that our intellectual, imaginative, and emotive predisposition towards the future is shaped by the events we grew up in, by our trajectories. So let me tell you about my trajectory. And my story is worthwhile sharing only because it echoes that of a generation. I don't think my personal story is inter interesting for you to, to listen to in any way, shape, or form. But it does echo, echo that of a generation. And in Palestine, this generation is called the Oslo generation. So it's very ironic that I'm talking about it here. There's a generation that grew up with the first Intifada from 1987 to 1993, and then came of age during the Oslo peace process. And these two events propelled us into the future, only to send us crashing into today's hopeless reality. So let me say something brief about both. It might sound strange to say that the first Intifada filled the younger generation with hope, given how repressive it was. 30,000 Palestinian children required medical treatment from the Israeli forces beating them in the first two years. <coughs> but it was very energizing for two reasons. First, because it was the first time since 1948 that the struggle emanated from Palestinians within Palestine. Until then, the Palestinian struggle, as many of you know, was mainly led from the outside. It was a struggle of the PLO in neighboring countries, first Jordan, Lebanon, and finally Tunisia. Now, finally, the struggle had come home, and we were part of it. And it was a mass struggle, where Palestinians from different walks of life rose against a colonial occupation founded on intimidation, humiliation, and manipulation. An occupation that worked through repression and fear, collaboration and treachery, beatings and torture chambers, and de facto annexation of territory illegally annexed through war. It was a struggle that mobilized all segments of the Palestinian population, and especially the youth to throw a stone at an Israeli soldier, wave a Palestinian flag, partake in an underground school, or be part of a general strike, and suddenly you were part of history. This was empowering. I do not want to romanticize this period of Palestinian history. It came with its contradictions, internal divisions, frustrations, and problems. And I surely do not want to romanticize my own story in it. What I want to stress is how this effect affected a generation's conception of hope, how it shaped its vision of the future and how it gave the impression that we were shaping our own destiny. Then came the peace process. Thank you, Oslo. First in Madrid in 1991, and then in Oslo in 1993. So rather than rehash the different components of the agreements, what I want to impress on you is the way peace affected the brain of a young teenager, teenager growing up in occupied Palestine. Imagine what it means to grow up witnessing the struggle and then seeing actual results because the peace process was presented as a response to the Intifada, somehow its achievement, 
Whether this is historically true is debatable. I'm only asking you to consider the way historical events are being plotted inside the young minds of Palestinians, living these events, not someone analyzing them. Today, of course, we know that the Oslo Accords allowed Israel to further colonize Palestinian land. But back then, we lived a schizophrenic reality. We saw settlements grow while we were celebrating the birth of our state to be. And I remember the jubilation, celebrating Yasser Arafat's return to Palestine and him embracing the floor on which he landed. I remember the jubilation of being able to wave a Palestinian flag without persecution and getting the international recognition we fought so hard for. And I still remember my father crying in the streets of Bethlehem when he saw the Palestinian police control our streets. And he, see this, he saw this as a liberation. My dad is a man of few words and very few tears. So the few tears he shed that day were quite crucial and symbolic for him. And I remember members of the diaspora returning to open businesses and reconnect with their roots. I remember a huge peace industry that had artificially injected billions of dollars into our economy, which resulted in large scale transformations in infrastructure, businesses, and lifestyles. I remember this vividly as a kid because it operated as a kind of magic in our naive brain. Finally, the future was on the horizon, and it was ours. The way to this future, we were told, was incremental. Progressive negotiations would lead to a lasting peace. The rhythm of our expectations were marked by rounds of negotiation. And we follow these on TV screens the way doctors monitor the supposed improvement of a patient's recovering from sickness. Um, and even the terminology of the negotiation gave this impression of progress. First, there was Oslo 1, and there was Oslo 2. And the names of the areas Israel would progressively relinquish were A and B and C. And supporting this illusion of progress was a chorus of NGOs that came to us talking about citizenship, rights, and democracy, not liberation. Of course, what we got was the exact opposite, and we know this now. And there's no need for me to go into the detail. 25 years, 25 years after the Oslo agreements, there's enough written on the subject to show that what we got was the exact opposite how peace led to colonization, rather, and how increased Palestinian economy meant decreased sovereignty, and how us Palestinians, and we are guilty of this, fetishized statehood over liberation. The Second Intifada marked the end of this process. And today, it's no longer controversial to admit that the peace process is dead. The shadow of Oslo has grown so dark that this small period of hope now appears like a dream. So this is my trajectory of hope. These are the events that shaped my mental, intellectual, imaginative, and emotive predisposition towards the future. It is marked by false promises. Today, I fear the word peace more than I fear the word war. The word salam, which in Arabic is used to greet strangers and friends, has become an insult in my mouth. And the supposed peace process has robbed me of a language with which I can talk about a just future between The generation of Oslo, my generation, is a humil humiliated generation. The generation of my father is also a humiliated generation. It's something that connects me and my father, and that's very true thing. <laughs> my father grew up with the promise of liberation that would be achieved through armed struggle. What he saw was the defeat of the Arab countries and the PLO. His lack of faith in the future is marked by the humiliations of war. I grew up with the promise of liberation that would be achieved through diplomatic means. What I saw was a peace process that was used to further colonize historical Palestine. My lack of faith in the future is marked by the humiliations of peace, which I think are doubly humiliating. So where does this leave us today? When one is hopeless, where does one look for hope? Do not expect me to answer these questions in ways that will make you hopeful. Actually, I have become very suspicious of people whose job it is to give me hope. I do not trust the words of foreign officials, NGOs, international institutions, the words of the Palestinian leadership or the Israeli leadership. When someone sells me hope, I fear for the future. Being doomed by hope means that you have to look for hope in the least likely of places. And it is with this that I want to conclude tonight. First, I find hope in being a problem rather than looking for solutions. And I find hope in the past rather than the future. So let me elaborate on both points. What does it mean to be a problem and how is being a problem source of hope. Hope as I grew up meant hope in a solution, 
more specifically, solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. People spoke of the future in terms of solutions. And thinking back, I realized how strange this was. Right? As if people were seeking a formula that was out there, that was magically solve an animosity between Israel and Palestinians, and magically do away with the case of separate from the other. People everywhere were searching for solutions, like alchemists looking for a philosophical stone. Until now, people place this crazy hope in they will find a solution as if it's a mathematical formula. So today I place my hope not in searching for a solution, but in being a problem. I draw inspiration partly from the African-American intellectual, sociologist, and civil rights activist, W. Du Bois, who in his famous book, The Soul of Black Folks, asked, how does it feel to be a problem? Du Bois was writing about black people in a segregated America, where the very existence of black people is assumed to be criminal, violent, and deviant. For the voice, of course, being a problem was something negative, not something that generates hope. For me, I think it's something that could generate hope. In Palestine today, just like in the voices segregated in America, then and now, Palestinians constitute a problem. Their very existence, their bodies, are marked as a threat to the state of Israel. This, just, this justifies treating them as a problem, monitoring, monitoring, controlling, and disciplining their very existence, their movement, what they think, what they say, and how many calories they eat. For example, this is how they calculate food entering Gaza. Why is being a problem hopeful, you may rightly ask? Because it's for the simple reason that we have managed to impose ourselves as a problem for a colonial project that seeks, seeks to replace one national group with another, and that we continue to be a problem for this colonial project. Existence, in this case, is resistance. Actually, Palestinians were not always a problem for the Zionist project. In his classic history of Zionism, the historian William Lefer, who recently passed away, argues that the early Zionist thinkers, Arabs were a, quote, an unseen question. That means they did not constitute a problem. And in fact, if you look at Zionist writing before the 1930s, Arabs do not exist as a problem. They exist as people, but they do not exist as a problem that Zionists have to take into consideration. For example, in Herzl's Zionist Utopia, called al Nulan, Old New World, there's an Arab character that comes up in by you know, the Palestinians called Rashid Bey, and when he talks about Zionism, it's in terms of a blessing, not a curse. Citing, for example, how Jewish immigration has brought tremendous benefits to the Arab and increased his orange business in, in, in Gaza. This is a classic colonial trope, whereby natives willingly buy into colonial projects because it propels them into modernity. Today we see, I think, something a bit similar, where the powers that be, Israelis and Americans, dispose of Palestinians as a problem. We are not a problem. Trump's deal of the century is being devised as we speak without even taking Palestinian partners into consideration. Even the ones that signed also agreement. Jerusalem is not a problem. The refugees are not a problem. The Israeli right also openly talks about the occupation as not a problem. Settlements are not a problem. The fact that actually we have managed to impose ourselves as a problem is an achievement. The fact that we still constitute a problem through boycott movements, the Great March of Return in Gaza, the activism of Palestinians within and outside of Palestine, is an achievement. Everything that rebels against an apartheid system is an achievement. This gives me hope. And the day we stop being a problem is the day I will actually lose hope. The second paradoxical claim I want to make is that I find hope in the past, not in the future. Now this is paradoxical because future the hope by definition is a future-oriented desire. We have in, we have hope in things that the things that will come, not the things that have passed. The Oslo peace process really insisted on that, that, that dichotomy. Everything that happened in the past caused conflict, everything that will happen in the future will cause peace. This shaped our temporality, I think, as young Palestinians. But finding hope in the past resists this dichotomy. It means insisting that past injustices be dealt with rather than ignored or forgotten. In this case, the Nakba still being a foundational thing we refer to when we talk about the future. It means finding inspiration in past struggles so that we don't lose face even when all things appear hopeless. 
He is resisting dominant narratives that impose a certain reading of the past. It also means redeeming the past, a past that people are saying that is no long, that no longer is. So take for example take for example discussions about binational, a binational one state solution in the early 20th century. Today, people talk about these ideas as utopian and aberrations of history. The dream of dreamers, not the project of makers. Finding hope in the past means redeeming these past possibilities rather than accepting defeat. Finding hope in the past does not mean hiding history or romanticizing it. It looks for the past to break free from the hopelessness of the present. Hope is as much a desire for the past as it is for the future. It is justice for those who died and to those who will come to live. Thank you.